I'm Claire Christian. I'm the Executive Director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. We're hosting this webinar today. Um, the reason we wanted to do it is to encourage uh, more public dialogue and awareness of Antarctic conservation issues, uh, specifically marine protected areas, which are something that uh, our organization, ASOC, has been advocating for for a number of years now. And there are a number of countries around the world who have been trying to get the MPAs created in Antarctica. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit about one of those areas where MPAs um, are being proposed, which is um, the Antarctic Peninsula. And we're going to talk about why this area is important, uh, what's going on down there now, um, and, uh, and uh, some other issues um, around that. And um, just as a kind of note, um, MP if, if this MPA and other MPAs that have been proposed um, were created uh, as high seas MPAs in the Antarctic, um, that would be the largest um, act of ocean protection ever in history. It would be over 3 million square kilometers, almost 4 million square kilometers of areas protected. Um, and so um, that is a pretty big uh, thing. I know in, in these times of COVID, we've been talking about our relationship to the natural world and how we need to change it. Uh, and that is one way that our organization thinks we could do that. Um, so if you support that goal, I'm going to put a link um, to a petition uh, in the chat. and. Um, please sign it. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A um, and we will be uh, holding questions till the panelists have finished speaking and then we will have them take questions. Um, and um, other than that, um, I'm just going to turn it over now to our moderator, Lynn Goldsworthy, who is a longtime uh, person who has worked for ASOC and um, probably one of the biggest Antarctic experts around, I would say. Um, and um, she will introduce our panelists and uh, talk a little bit more about the webinar. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. And I'm hoping that uh, Claire will be able to let our final panelist in, Caesar, but while um, we're waiting, I um, first just want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional elders, past and present, of the lands upon which we are all meeting, and welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, we will be hearing from four really knowledgeable and passionate speakers, and I hope then we'll have a very stimulating question-answer discussion. Um, before we start, just remind everybody, including myself, that we have many different cultures represented on the um, call. So please speak slowly and clearly. And um, don't forget to send your questions to Claire so um, we can start to collect those in time for the discussion. Um, and Claire didn't note that we are recording this. So I'm hoping that um, that is all okay with all of you who are present. So we have four great speakers. We have Paul Schoolground from the krill industry. We have Amanda Lennis from the tourist industry. We have Dr. Cesar Cadenos, who hopefully will join us in a second, um, who is a senior scientist yeah. from Chile. And we have uh, Dr. Yunhee Kim, um, who is a researcher from the non-government sector in um, Seoul, Korea. They've only been given five minutes to give you a taste of their thoughts. And as Claire said, uh, we will run all four speakers first and then open up for questions and discussions. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Skogrund, who is the Director of uh, Antarctic Affairs at the Krill Harvesting Company, Acker Biomarine. Paul has been involved in CAMELA, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which is the convention responsible for regulating human activities in the Southern Ocean around the Antarctic. He's been involved in CAMELA matters for around 10 years. The first several years as an advisor on the Norwegian government delegation and the last three representing the Association of Responsible Krill Harvesting Companies, ARC. Paul, over to you. Thank you. And thanks to ASOP for inviting me. Um, so pleased to be here. Just hold, this, hold on a second, I'll share my screen. Here we go. 
Yeah, I'm I'm Paul. I'm from Aki Biomarine, the Norwegian krill harvesting company. Krill is what we know from the operations to the business side to the science side. We have fishermen who stay in the white of Antarctica for months every year. And all of the photos you see here are actually taken by our crew, our deckhands, the fish mates, the captains. They really care about Antarctica. It's their workplace. Antarctic conservation to us, it's a moving picture. Always new hoops to jump through. Nature is changing, policy and regulation is changing too. This keeps industry moving forward, sometimes even faster than regulation. And I think this is a good thing. Most of Antarctica is completely left alone. But what we do to the areas that we use is of course much more important than what we do to the areas that we don't use. It was never going to be easy to find solution for uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, but we will get there. On this point, a friend of mine from the NGO and I, we fully agree. Whatever your assessment is of the as-is situation, Antarctic conservation is about getting it right for the future. Now onto the krill. So is there a fishery in the world today that makes out uh, that takes out the less uh, uh, that takes out less compared to what the actual biomass is. Krill is a hugely underutilized marine resource, and we feel at Occupy Marine we are only scratching the surface of what krill can be utilized for. The current krill management regime has several layers of precaution, but to meet our ambition, we need a krill management conservation system that is stronger, that has the broad legitimacy with the communities that care about the Antarctic region. And this is not really about whether the catch is X or Y tons, it is about creating a certainty for the future. That we know about the size and the flux of the krill stream that we're actually fishing from. And we call this feedback management. And uh, this is a case uh, in point where Camelar has devised a plan with building blocks from different nations across interests, getting support from industry and NGOs. And there's obviously lots of work to be done, but there's a rock solid foundation that they are building on going forward. A part of this system, um, whether it's a part of or on the side, there will also be marine sanctuaries. So when does this happen? It is really up to us to create a trustful climate to get that progress. And I think that we are all accountable to get that progress that we need. I'll, I'll tell you what we can do from in industry. We can collect data for science. Um, Archibiomarine probably collects more acoustic data than Camelar member states combined. And there will be more data collected in the future years across different platforms because now technology and science has pushed Camelar on that path towards a dynamic system for setting krill catch levels. Industry can also offer advice on practical implication of regulations. Where fisheries managers tell industry where to fish, results are not always great, not for conservation and not for fisheries. We need to be at the table. Industry can do precautionary efforts because we can. In, in 2018, the ARC, uh, which is the krill fishery organization, established a penguin buffer zone where we keep harvesting 30 to 40 kilometers away from penguin colonies during breeding season. It's voluntary, but it's the only purely spatial resolution for the krill fishery. Industry can also contribute to breaking the deadlock, as you say, across the divide. Moving forward is actual discussion on areas and, and regulations. We want to have these discussions in good faith. Oops, sorry. I don't think there's anyone we can't work with and we are always available for building new relationships. We are not going anywhere. And then some humble advice and reflection on what needs to be solved, resolved uh, at the end. There's obviously different views on precaution, what constitutes a risk, what constitutes probability for a bad event. These things need to be sorted out. 
we need to move outside of our comfort zones, all of us. The knee-jerk reactions are not always very, very, very constructive. For us harvesters, for instance, we need to acknowledge that sometimes it is not enough for it is not enough to regulate to harvest. We also need to to understand that no-take zones are not that dangerous. They can actually be a wise move. For 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 others, um, it's important to 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 don't take solutions off the table that can be scientifically sound and that can uh, work towards a conservation. Um, and so when an, an MPA in the peninsula is adopted, and I say when, it will be for the entire Antarctic community, and we all need to, to own it. So a greater shared ownership of the MPA, uh, of MPA as a concept across, uh, uh, across interest is absolutely necessary. Industry is not the roadblock here. But we can approach the roadblocks from a, from a different angle and give momentum to this conservation conservation process. My company has shown what, what we can do in getting the international quill fleet moving towards the voluntary conservation, and we are not done. And I think stalemate is not an option, so let's make sure that we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think it's been really interesting watching the krill industry engage in the broader conservation and science issues in Kamala and uh, build the partnerships with some unlikely alliances, one might think, um, uh, to help uh, build a very strong future. Um, uh, welcome, Caesar. It's lovely to see you there. It's um, my great pleasure now to uh, introduce Amanda Lennis, who is the Director of Environment and Science Coordination for the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, uh, known as IATO. She has stayed up very late, as had uh, Paul, I might add, um, to join us today. Um, and she has a wealth of knowledge about the Antarctic from both the industry and visitor perspective. And we'll be talking today about the power of the peninsula, what she calls passion, people and protection. Amen. Oh, oh, thank you very much for that introduction, Lynn. And um, it's a real privilege to be here um, talking to you all. And thank you very much. So yes, my name is Amanda and I represent um, the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators or um, IATO, as we call it. It is a membership organization uh, with safe, environmentally sensitive travel at its heart. So we manage our activities so that people can go to Antarctica and have an enriching and educational visit um, with as little impact as possible. And of course, we work within the framework of the Antarctic Treaty System. The peninsula is um, incredibly important to us. Um, and, um, I'd say almost everyone who travels to Antarctica is going to go with an IATO operator. And around 98% of people who travel every year with us do go to visit the wonders of um, the peninsula. Last December, I was lucky enough to be on a vessel bound for Antarctica for the peninsula. Um, and being December, um, it was Christmas for many people on board. Um, and that meant that there were several children on the vessel, which is always a lot of fun. And they were all really excited uh, as we left South America until we got on to the Drake Passage and as the ship started to roll and bump they actually all disappeared and there was one nine-year-old boy who really stayed in his bunk for about two days um, barely <laughs> leaving it um, apart, to, uh, apart from going to uh, the mandatory briefings that are required uh, before you visit Antarctica. And when I spoke to him, he said, why do you like this so much? This is the worst experience of my life. Um, and I only hoped that it would get better for him, which it did. Um, as we neared the peninsula, of course, the, the sea started to become um, more calm. Um, the sun came out and it was illuminating all the icebergs uh, around us. And I went to see if he was, um, if he was seeing all this and he was, he was kneeling in his bunk and looking out of his porthole. Um, and he was watching the penguins, porpoising, plopping past to the, 
the porthole in the sea, um, and a humpback whale even chose that moment to surface and breathe just off the ship. And he literally burst into tears of joy. And at that moment, it was a life-defining moment for him. Um, and I believe he became an Antarctic ambassador. And we both cried at that time. And I know for sure that he has been uh, lecturing his school and all his, his buddies at home um, and talking to everyone about the power of the peninsula um, for him. Um, so that's just one example of the peninsula's power over people. But of course, people have been experiencing its wonders for at least 200 years. Exploration and um, exploitation, of course, it's got its fair history um, with that too. It's steeped in human history. Um, rich in wildlife, scenery, and magic, if you want to see it. And happily now, it is protected through the unique and globally important Antarctic Treaty system and has been for the past 60 years. And that does the job of bringing together a community of nations, research programs, and responsible industry who are all working together towards protecting Antarctica for peace and science. My own passion for Antarctica is derived from studying penguins. Basically to understand how as predators they use their environment to rear the next generations of penguins. And I just wanted to share with you um, one of my favourite sounds of Antarctica, I'm trying to bring um, the peninsula to you and I'll just see if they'll talk now. This was um, the sound from my office um, I suppose. <laughs> so that that job that I was lucky enough to do, um, that was a big part of that was, was was sharing data and knowledge. Of course, that is instilled through the Antarctic Treaty. But I realised how vital that sharing was. And in those years of research, um, uh, studying penguins, I was also introduced for the first time to the inspiring world of Ayato. And I realized that when managed well, tourism can be a powerful force for good. But then in an area, but in an area like the peninsula, where there are overlapping human activities, tourism, um, science, um, and fishing, that the sharing of knowledge and understanding each other's goals and passions is vital to protect the peninsula and Antarctica. It's so true that we will work to try and protect the things that we know and love. Visiting or working um, in Antarctica is, is an immense privilege. Um, and those that do, as Paul said, we are held accountable, we are duty bound to protect it. We all have a duty to protect it. And it may seem far away, it may seem like another world, and in many ways it is, that's why we love it so much. But it does impact all of us. And the challenges to protect it are growing. And the guests here today, um, including ASOC and its members, um, the science community, uh, responsible industry, we all agree that the key to the future and marine protected areas, of course, is working to understand each other and our missions, our obligations, and of course, the peninsula in order to protect it. All of us and you as Hello. global citizens, thank you, Lynn. All of us and you as global citizens, I feel, have the power as people to come together and protect the peninsula so that our children and their children will continue to see the magic in our special world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, as someone who has 132 photographs of my very first iceberg, I certainly can uh, understand the passion uh, that visitors um, feel when they go to the Antarctic. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how IATO continues to work with other stakeholders to ensure the protection of this really special area. Um, thank you again. Um, um, Caesar, I would um, really like to now in introduce our third speaker, Dr. Caesar Cardenas. Um, a researcher at the Chilean Antarctic Institute and also 
um, for his sins, a Chilean representative to the scientific committee of uh, Kamala. He has many, many years of experience as an Antarctic scientist and also um, in participating at Antarctic meetings. I suspect he's also up at uh, some ungodly hour. And today he's going to talk to us about the Domain One MPA proposal, Marine Protected Area proposal, and the importance of protection in a changing scenario. Caesar. Thank you, uh, uh, Lynn. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, good morning, good night. Uh, um, so yeah, I'll try to be to show you the work that we we have been doing uh, for many years now in uh, five minutes. So wish me luck. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, Antarctica, an incredible continent, as uh, we know and as we've seen today and in the past, of course. A uh, continent that sh has been changing a lot. It changes a lot between winter and uh, summer. It's perhaps the one of the biggest changes that occur on uh, Earth. But uh, it's uh, changing more in the last uh, decades. We know that not only that the warming of the atmosphere has been increasing. It also it's occurring in the water column, in the in the ocean. And of course, that is uh, associated or is producing a lot of changes, uh, and, and a lot of other physical changes like uh, increases in glacial discharge, increased uh, precipitation, retreat of uh, uh, ice uh, masses, and so on. So this, as I said, this is a very particular uh, continent, and and by default, the, the fauna and the ecosystem is is unique as well. So uh, all the organisms there has, has evolved for millions of years in this very cold and stable uh, environment, but now it's changing and uh, this will produce a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, troubles for, for many species. Most of them are expected to be losers. They, they won't be able to cope with, with these changes while others will, be, will, will cope better with that. So we also have this this little fellow, the the krill, because as we know, as we hear from Paul, it, it's uh, it's focus of uh, the most important uh, fishery in the Southern Ocean, and it's uh, it happens mainly in the domain one, the Antarctic Peninsula, and uh, it has been a matter of a study in uh, and discussions in recent years because uh, the concentration of catches has been increasing in space and uh, time. So as I say, this is a, a, a work that Argentina and Chile has been developing since 2012 through a series of uh, workshops and meetings. And uh, a couple of years ago, the, the end of this first part of the process was the presentation of the um, uh, uh, proposal, the formal proposal. So uh, this this is a, the long table, but it's just to show that the 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 objective of the MPA is not only to uh, protect one species or a couple of species. It's about the ecosystem, but the the environment uh, processes, uh, and so on. So this is if you want to see how our maps looks like in terms of objectives. This is how they look. And this is the main proposal. This is the, the, the domain one proposal. The area in orange is the area of the peninsula or the marine protected area where the uh, fleet will be able to, sorry? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Cesar, but I don't think we can see your screen. Can you hit share screen again? I'm sorry about that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I tried to, to chat to you earlier, but I don't think you saw it. Okay. So apologies everybody for interrupting. That's right. Uh, there we go. That looks great. Thank you. Okay. You can just hit the little... Just carry on where you were. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, uh, okay. So this is, this is the, the, the previous one was the... Uh, this is how our maps looks like. But this is the, the, the proposal. Uh, the area in, uh, in, uh, in orange, it's the the krill uh, fishery zone where the fleet will be able to operate and, and, and catch krill. And all the areas in blue are uh, general protection zones. 
and they are, uh, they aim to protect different uh, objectives. It's not necessarily uh, related to krill. It, it depends on the area. Uh, it tried to um, protect one or a series of, uh, of objectives. So in the northern tips of the peninsula, for example, just this is just an example, we're trying to protect these uh, red uh, dots here, uh, which are mainly um, Adelie penguins. This is one of the main colonies in the peninsula. Uh, in the rest of the, or in the, where the, uh, if you go south, this is a very important area because everything's going on here. You can see penguins feeding on krill and it's a lot of food here. And of course there are whales feeding on krill. Uh, so this is a very important area. There are a lot of uh, different penguin colonies, different predators fed on krill here. And also it's the area where the, <coughs> the, the, the fleet operates. So yeah, the, the, they'll keep swimming here. So I'll just jump to the next one. I think that's the end of the foraging trip. That surface. All right. You have one minute maximum. Okay. So if we if we go uh, for the south, uh, uh, we also aim to protect this this guy and of course the areas that are important for reproduction and for early stages of krill. There are also a few colonies, very few colonies uh, until the uh, recent um, times. There was just one described colony of emperor penguins. Uh, in the last uh, couple of months, uh, another uh, couple of small colonies have been described here. And this is in the, in the southernmost part of the um, peninsula. So as I say at the beginning, it's, it's more about the protection of the ecosystem of course, the krill and the predators uh, uh, and a lot of uh, different species and the biodiversity that, that is present uh, in the area. So uh, yeah, yeah, this is just uh, uh, most, mostly what I say is like the, we know that the peninsula is very important. It's, it's, uh, it's undergoing a lot of changes. It's a very productive area and uh, we're trying to uh, achieve protection of different conservation objectives. Uh, and also recognizing the need for, uh, to contemplate uh, human activities. And um, hopefully we will be able to uh, reach a consensus um, relatively soon. <laughs> so thanks. Thank you so much, Cesar. If you could um, cancel your screen sharing so that um, Yunhi can get organized. Um, I think um, the impacts of climate change in the peninsula area are so disturbingly evident these days. And um, um, I, most of us that are involved in Antarctic matters are very grateful for the work that Argentina and Chile are doing to promote the MPA. And I certainly hope you do get it up soon. Um, I would like now to introduce Dr. Yunhi Kim, um, who is a researcher with the Citizens Institute for Environmental Studies, which is affiliated to the Korean Federation for the Environment Movement, KFEM. Kim, uh, sorry, Yunhee has um, attended several Kamala meetings as part of the Korean delegation or on the ASOC delegation. And uh, she will be talking to us today about climate change in the Antarctic Peninsula region, a little bit about her research that in that area and the role of MPAs in addressing um, the uh, problems the peninsula is uh, experiencing. Yun Hee. We can't hear you at the moment. We can't hear you, Yun Hee. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yeah, we can. My now. apologize. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> <all right>. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Lynn. Um, good morning and good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure to give a short presentation for this webinar today. I would like to briefly talk about climate change and protect, uh, marine protected areas, insured MPAs. I also would like to uh, introduce a glimpse of my research, as Lynn uh, mentioned, and uh, stress a potential positive role of Korea in protecting the Antarctic uh, in the future. Um, 
First, uh, I'd like to introduce my institute, uh, CIES. We have been working closely with ASO uh, to protect the Antarctic environment. As you can see the photos on the left, we organized workshops over the last few years, and this became more international. So last year, we had participants from Chile, Japan, the UK, um, the US, Canada, and uh, New Zealand to talk about MPA issues uh, at the Camilla. The next slide shows a little bit of my uh, research on climate change and contaminants, um, as you see uh, in the figure on the top left here. Um, the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the areas showing the most evident effects of climate change which is the warming that has been much greater than other regions of the Antarctic. This change also decreased cold years with the increasing melting glaciers. Um, as you can see, the figure on the bottom uh, left um, as reported in 2017, our Larsen Sea ice shelf uh, finally broke off Antarctica, releasing giant um, uh, iceberg, which was recorded one of the largest one. Given that uh, my research interest came to look at in, um, impacts of melting glaciers on um, releasing contaminants that have been trapped in there for, for many years. So I wanted to test a hypothesis if uh, inputs of contaminants like mercury from melting glaciers would increase to coastal environment, and this may eventually um, impact mercury levels in penguins uh, through tropic transport. Um, next, uh, here are some photos I took while I was in the Antarctic. The top on the left is the Merriam Cove covered by glaciers. Um, while I was there, um, sometimes I heard a very loud sound uh, like a thunder. And I learned this was the sound when the ice shelf fell off the ground. And the photo, um, uh, the next to it, um, is what I saw um, at the low tide. And this massive ice flow to the water just at the uh, high tide, uh, eventually just melting away. Um, the next photo is showing a road to uh, one of the penguin colonies. Uh, when I arrived there, snow was mostly um, covered uh, the hill. Then by the time when I left uh, a few weeks later, um, the snow was mostly gone. So from my experience in the Antarctic, I can say summer there was quite warmer than I had expected. So now I would like to move on to um, talk about MPAs and climate change uh, briefly. Uh, many studies um, demonstrated that well-managed MPAs are the most effective conservation tool. Studies also show that MPA can help uh, mitigate, oops, sorry. Mitigate and adapt to the impact of the climate change. So interestingly, MPAs are not very popular in Korea. Um, we have short and relevant scientific research, good management uh, scheme, relevant policies and regulations, and public awareness. So because of these regions, CIES and KFEM are working hard to address this uh, importance of the MPA um, in Korea. So this is my last slide uh, showing Korea's status at the Camilla. Uh, Korea is one of the major fishing countries at the Camilla, and fishing interest uh, has usually come first uh, before conservation. The next figure um, is showing the process of the building to consensus for adopting Camilla MPAs. As you can see, um, Korea is one of the main supporters for endorsing uh, MPA designation, mainly because of the uh, concerns of losing uh, future uh, fishing opportunities. But as a responsible fishing nation, Korea needed to uh, step up actively, uh, contributing to protecting 
Antarctic marine environment and becoming one of the leading countries who care about handing over our, our healthy oceans uh, for the next generation. So this is all for my presentation today and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Yunhee, and I think um, it, it, you should be um, very happy with the role that you have played in getting uh, Korea to understand more that the Southern Ocean is more than fishing. I'm um, very happy now to open um, questions up. I think we've had some really interesting, broad-ranging uh, um, presentations here and I'm going to ask a question first to Caesar. Um, some people will say that it's inevitable that countries will fight over Antarctica in the future because they will want to exploit it. Do you think that's true or do you think we can hold on to the treaty values of peace, conservation and science collaboration? I'm asking you because you've been to many of these meetings. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Lydia. Yeah, that that that's a very interesting uh, question. And uh, yeah, we nor we normally hear that uh, people commenting on that. And I think for us that uh, we have been involved in the Antarctic Treaty system for many years, we can uh, we 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 are confident that uh, we can hold off that and uh, that we will continue working in a collaboration with many other countries. Uh, but uh, yeah, from from a, from people, you can understand the views from people that it's not really um, related to the Antarctic Treaty system, and and it it's it looks like it's almost something that it will be impossible to maintain or even to establish. But uh, we know how successful the Antarctic Treaty system has been. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really confident that we can, we can keep working together. I've muted myself. Um, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm um, good. Um, th thank you for that. I think we probably want to pull that apart a little bit more, but I'll ask a couple more questions um, and we'll come back to it. Um, uh, Paul, a question from uh, the audience um, about the data that you're collecting. Is it data that's available for viewing for the general public? Are you doing any data analytics on it? And how can data science help? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. As uh, Kamlar is moving in a more uh, data uh, heavy direction in terms of fisheries management. So I think that uh, there will be more data sharing in the future. There will be more data analytics. Um, at the moment, we have we have been collecting data and we're not doing very much with it. Uh, I think that over the past year, it's been also a, a huge uh, a huge development with us to try and, uh, and and look at how we manage that data uh, and how we can make it more easily accessible. Um, but of course, we we are we're still sort of um, early doors, if you will, in uh, how to um, uh, how to, to to set up a good management for all the data that's that's collected. Mm, it's going to be really important for the development of the MPA too, I suspect. Um, so, following on from my um, horrible question to Caesar. Um, Damon Stanwell Smith has asked a question for all or any of the panelists. Is the governance model of Camelot fit for purpose given the stalemate in, the, in recent times on the MPA adoption, uh, particularly given that it's been blocked by one or two countries? I'm not sure who wants to start again. Caesar or Yunhee? Um, well, yeah, you, I, I, yeah I can, I can start. <laughs> I always try to um, to take these questions from the view of the, I mean, highlighting the 
beauty of the Antarctic treaty system and the consensus and how successful it has been. Uh, but at the same time, it's true that we are getting a bit of trouble in, in recent years. We, we kind of uh, lost momentum in, in terms of the adoption of, of, of MPA. And um, we, we normally ask the same questions to ourselves in terms of how, how can we move forward and, and how can we uh, adapt the, the way that we're uh, making decisions. But I think it, it's, it's really hard to, to mm. I mean, if, if you ask me, I don't really know how to <laughs> pro progress in that way. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think um, those that know Kamala will know that Kamala is not um, like a, a regional fisheries management organization. And so it does have the opportunity for establishment of biodiversity um, uh, based uh, marine protected areas. It's built into the convention, yeah. And um, it's also based on precaution and um, ecosystem um, approaches and its objective is conservation. So I suspect, and maybe someone else might want to comment on this, that um, one of the issues is that the consensus decision-making process has become a bit more like a veto process. And perhaps uh, the Kamala should be looking at ways to bring its decision-making process back to being um, consensus-based. Um, maybe while people think about that, Yun He, um, what, what do you think um, the role of, an, of a country like Korea would be in breaking that um, stalemate, given that it's not seen as a standard conservation-oriented country? Oh, <laughs> very mm -hmm. difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess, I mean, still Korea, you know, government, um, you know, like their way is more protecting industries rather than environment. That's, that's still the way it is. So I'm, I'm still having some difficult times when I uh, speak to them. But they are changing, that's my hope, and that's a good thing. You know, I can see, even though it's very slowly moving forward, but I can see the change. So I guess uh, we just have to keep trying and more public interest and support to push our government, you know, uh, mm. to do the right thing. That's very important. And yeah. like, uh, you know, um, following up the census uh, answers um, about the, you know, vetoing uh, state members for uh, MPAs, um, those countries um, can also need some um, more public uh, interest and support, I think. Thank you, Yunhi. Um, Amanda, you mentioned um, Antarctic ambassadors very briefly. And um, so what do you think IATO can do to help bring um, the um, MPA detractors um, into domain one protection? You have a lot of visitors who could, you know, also be part of um, this process. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Yes, and that's, that's true. And from my perspective too, the values of a marine protected area definitely align with the values that we uphold as well within IATO. And I was, I was just thinking about um, Damon's question too, and how um, the Antarctic Treaty system in general. I know that I know there are problems with the consensus-based decision making, um, and tourism isn't regulated within Camelot, It's actually regulated within the Antarctic Treaty, uh, sorry, the Antarctic Treaty consultative meeting. So it's all within the Antarctic Treaty system. Um, and we have similar processes there. And I was thinking how, um, of course, there is the tourism industry and there is the fishing industry, but the Antarctic Treaty system has also really helped to promote responsible industry because industry has to be within that remit. Industry has to be responsible within Antarctica. And for sure, IATO is carrying a lot of nations well you know in future as well things have sort of slowed a little bit at the moment but um in future 
um, will again be carrying nations down to the peninsula, um, some of which from the countries uh, who are questioning MPAs at, at Kamalar. And I think um, IATO can um, do more to strengthen its Antarctic ambassador concept. We already have ambassadors, uh, sorry, operators and staff um, who do promote um, the protection of MPAs and to educate our guests and, and every trip to Antarctica does include an educational component in order to really um, give that enriching experience of people. The aim is to get people to come away from Antarctica being inspired and wanting to learn more about how we can protect it but ultimately it's, ultimately it's about collaboration and I think even this, just today this panel sort of demonstrates a willingness to work together and collaborate. That's the key to getting this to move forward. I believe it can be done, um, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda. I, I mean, it's a good opportunity now to ask Paul what he thinks the um, art can do to help promote um, Domain One protection. Um, you, you know, you're usually seen, industry is seen as negative to this sort of stuff. So what do you think mm. art can do as, proactively to help? I think um, ARC will, will also be measured on what we uh, and how we are able to contribute to, to this to this process um, and of course through industry we can reach uh, maybe different channels um, so it's all about sort of trying to keep that dialogue going and um, because it's 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 quite different to I mean, the problem, I mean, uh, just to pick on, up on what we were seeing, what we've been talking about earlier, it's, I mean, the, the problem with Camelot today is not really that you, that you, that you discuss and have different views. The, the, the problem today is that you, you find that there's, there's, there's not substantive discussion on important issues. And that, that's something completely different when you sort of, when you're being denied the opportunity to actually engage and to actually to actually sit down around around the table and, and look at areas, look at different uh, different ways to to move forward. So I think that um, with the industry, we we can definitely be a, a force for good to to pick up what what Amanda is saying um, and try and work work through these um, these channels. And I think that what what we're doing with the voluntary measures shows that we we, we can actually get nations uh, get measures moving across across nations across the industry from different parts mm. yeah it's interesting um we might come back to the voluntary measures in a second i have a, a excellent question here from kath wallace um hi kath from new zealand um so caesar noted that the domain one mpa conservation objectives cover human activities yet uh, she understands it's being discussed within Kamala, which covers resource exploitation and fishing. How is other human activity, such as tourism and science activities, field science, etc., being incorporated into um, the planning for the Domain One MPA? Um, yeah, th thanks for that question. Uh, as Amanda mentioned, um, tourism is under the umbrella of the Antarctic Treaty uh, consultative meeting, so uh, that's that's a different thing. Uh, but in terms of uh, national Antarctic programs and and um, fieldwork or science in general, uh, we have incorporated a lot of science from from other countries. Not this is not just based all based from. Uh, science coming from Argentina and Chile, it comes from, from different members or as we call countries, uh, members in Kamala. Uh, and and once, once the MPA is adopted, then Kamala uh, uh, designs and agrees on a research and monitoring plan. And that's where uh, we define some uh, questions that need to be addressed in terms of science and also to, moni to monitor the effectiveness of the MPA. So in that case, uh, other national Antarctic programs can contribute to that, trying to um, answer those questions. And at the same time, they can still run their um, the, the priorities or research priorities that they want to run. We, we can really dictate uh, everything they want to do. Like uh, you can really, or Camera can really uh, stop uh, other uh, 
National Antarctic programs to, to run their, their science, but they can uh, make some really and substantive uh, contributions to uh, the research and monitoring plan of, the, of this MPA or any camera MPA. So, um, Amanda, Paul, and Caesar, do you think that um, tourist industry or um, krill industry can be part of the monitoring and research programs for the um, MPA? And how might we do that? If yes, we want to go. Uh -oh. Yes. <laughs> Paul. Absolutely. Yeah. Or Caesar. Yeah, Paul. So I, I was just going to say we are in Antarctica for um, times a year when not many other uh, other people are. So yes, we can we can be uh, we can be part of that for sure. And Caesar, what would that mean? What would they need to do? Yeah, both both uh, uh, tourism and um, and uh, the fishing industry are very important. Um, Kamar is also working in the, a new management approach of the krill fishery and uh, the the industry will play a, a, a very important role there contributing with data and also as a platform for a scientist uh, in the same manner tourism um, is also becoming an important platform for for antarctic science in general uh, uh, within camera there are already some uh, initiatives uh, research projects that uh, involve Sayato so then some scientists from from different countries working together can use uh, 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 tourist uh, vessels as a platform so I think both can can play a major role now and of course in the future uh, in terms of the, again the research and monitoring plan of the MPA. Amanda? Yeah, just uh, no. Cesar is absolutely right, and, and just to add on to that, um, an example of that is actually IATO vessels carrying marine mammal observers. Um, so as they're doing transits back, back and forth in South America, um, they are looking out for counting whales, identifying whales, and, and collecting those data um, to understand um, a bit more about that. And IATO vessels, on the whole, um, well, IATO as a whole does support long-term monitoring because that's absolutely vital for understanding changes in the ecosystem. And I can say that as we understand changes in the ecosystem, we can adapt accordingly, but actually what we really want to do is identify changes before they happen so that we can take action um, before any changes that could be an issue become an issue, if that makes sense. Cool. So although tourism is regulated through um, a slightly different mechanism, um, we're all, users of that same important marine space um, so it comes back to collaborating um, with each other and for sure IATO um, would um, yes would want to contribute to our knowledge um, and understanding of the peninsula and that would include um, monitoring as well. So, so picking up on that I mean obviously IATO has um, quite strict rules or I mean, it's probably not obvious to others but um, IATO does uh, uh, put quite strict rules um, on its visitors with respect to avoiding disturbance of the environment and wildlife. But just being in Antarctica has an environmental impact. So what is IATO doing to reduce that um, impact? Oh my goodness, that would be a whole nother <laughs> hour <laughs> of discussion um, so I have to kind of like decide what, like bring that back um, so first of all any human activity in Antarctica has the potential for impact and it's absolutely how it's managed that's that's the fundamental thing um, so of course tourism is managed it's regulated through the Antarctic Treaty System um, and the Antarctic Treaty System the ATCM um, the consultative meeting has set some incredibly useful rules um, in Antarctica. For example, um, you can't ships carrying more than 500 people can't land ashore. You have to have um, a minimum staff to, pass pa bleh, staff to passenger ratio of 1 to 20 um, if you're ashore. And there's even restrictions on which sites you can visit across the peninsula, how many people can go ashore any one time never more than 100, but it depends on the site um, and even what time of year that they go. Um, 
uh, and visit each site. And IATO has um, a very important mechanism that we call it the ship scheduler. Um, and every year um, ships use the scheduler to make sure that they only visit certain sites when they're allowed to at particular times. So the Antarctic Treaty System itself or the ATCM, the guidelines, the rules, or actually we view it as tools for visiting responsibly is super important. But on top of all that, um, we also have a whole enormous suite of procedures and guidelines that we follow to ensure that our operators and our guests um, are doing what's necessary to have minimum impact. And that, like I said before, includes science and monitoring. Sometimes people get a little bit confused with what IATO can and can't do. So um, when it comes, we all know about tourism growth, I think, and, and more and more people come into the peninsula um, and IATO is working really, really hard to manage that. But what we can actually do is regulate that. Only the Antarctic Treaty parties can do that. And the Antarctic Treaty parties, the co com competent authorities, everyone who goes to Antarctica has to have a permit or authorization to go to Antarctica. And that would show for tourism that it has no more than a minor or transitory impact on the environment. So our IATO operators are really committed to adhering to those permits and authorization. And IATO itself self-manages our activities to do that, but we can't regulate how many are going and we can't restrict how many are going. So only so that's one area that um, yeah. the treaty parties um, have to work to. And IATO does go to the ATCM every year and we submit endless papers about what we're doing so that they have the best available information to base their decisions yeah. on. It. And yeah. I'm sure as Paul would say too, is that the industry, you have to make things practical for the industry. Yeah. People really want to do the right thing. So yeah. you have to support that as well, because there's plenty of room for people to come down and do the wrong thing if you... Okay, I thank you very much for trying to answer a very complex question in a very short period of time. Um, Yun He, I, you know, I alluded earlier to the incredible role that um, the NGO movement um, ha and you personally have played in uh, bringing the Korean and, uh, government to um, play, if you like, within Kamala. How, I've got two questions for you. This is the first one. How um, important do you think the NGO movement is in promoting conservation within Kamala and the Antarctic Treaty? Uh, how important? <laughs> very, very, very important. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, the ASO presence at the Camilla is very important um, because otherwise, you know, the public has very uh, little chance to know about what's going on at the Camilla, what has been discussed at the Camilla, um, because government officials, you know, they don't have to actually share those things with the public they don't i don't know they are too busy so, or something so yeah so, so delivering the, yeah yeah so sorry go ahead the korean um people um think about antarctic protection do they know about it and do you think their views influence the government um Yes, Korean people, they all love penguins. I have not seen anyone who don't like <laughs> penguins. So, <laughs> and they have very, very strong attachment with uh, the Antarctic uh, wildlife. So they are very um, eager to, you know, uh, they want to participate uh, in, you know, protecting the Antarctic environment. And our government is, in our uh, constitution, <laughs> government officials are like uh, people, our like a servant, you know, so they need to hear what we want, you know, so that's very important, uh, public interest and support and pressure on our government to do the, the right thing for the um, environment, uh, environment protection. Okay. Um, I actually have a question for Claire, which is a little unreasonable, but seeing she's not a panelist, but um, long time engagement in um, Antarctic um, conservation and uh, treaty meeting and Kamala meetings. What's your perception of 
how we are progressing towards maintaining Antarctic, um, the Antarctic values of conservation, um, scientific collaboration and peace. And do you think it's possible to actually take those values out into the bigger world? Uh, well, I think we're at a really important crossroads here for the Antarctic. Um, you know, people all over the world are talking about climate change, they're talking about biodiversity loss, and, um, you know, in the Antarctic we have climate change, but, you know, we don't have kind of the massive biodiversity loss you see in more settled areas. Um, but I still think that this is, this is the opportunity, you know, we have uh, increasing impacts on this region, and um, now is the time that we need to protect it because we know we know what happens, you know, we look outside every day and, you know, especially here in the United States, we've had such incredible extreme weather over the past few weeks. Like we know that the, we know what the consequences of our actions are and Antarctica is the last place we kind of have to get it right, I think, despite the fact that climate change is happening and we can't stop that to an extent. Um, we have a real opportunity in Antarctica to make better choices than we made um, in the rest of the world. And um, I think that, that unfortunately that, uh, you know, the views on how to do that are not universal within CAMELAR. Um, the convention itself, the treaty that all these countries signed is very clear that conservation, you know, means protecting the whole ecosystem. But unfortunately, I don't think that everybody is on that same page. And I would just invite those countries that are not, um, thinking about how they can can conserve the Antarctic and live up to the the obligations of the, the major international treaty they signed to just you know look around I mean you know this <laughs> the environment you know we 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 know what happens when we don't uh take strong action to protect our environment and um I just you know I hope that they can do that and I mean if if there is any hope I guess I would say that being in the Antarctic policy realm for a long time um it does take a long time to change people's minds, but you know, we, you know, for a long time, people were talking about how to regulate mining in Antarctica. And it was only because of dedicated efforts to convince people that we don't want any mining in Antarctica, <laughs> even well-regulated mining that we got in a moratorium. So it takes a long time, but I think once you get those decisions in place, they're very durable. And we do already have marine protected areas in Antarctica. We have two that we've agreed already. So in the Ross Sea and the South Orkneys. So if we can agree on MPAs, we can, um, you know, we can agree on more. Uh, I just, it just takes everybody coming to the table with good faith and really thinking about the future instead of, you know, the short term present. Um, you know, what, what kind of legacy do you want to have left behind? Um, and bringing, you, you asked about bringing Antarctic values elsewhere. I think that's something I'd really like to see because, you know, we talk about, everybody on this call is talking about how much they care about protecting this place and you know, sometimes when I listen to people talk about environmental policy in the United States where I live, it's, it's how much, it's not how can we protect this, it's how much can we get away with, you know, mm -hmm. how many wetlands can we destroy for this housing project, you know, mm -hmm. how many, you know, how much um, pollution can we put into the river before the water is unsafe to drink, and if we instead took the same approach we take in Antarctica, which is like, okay, well, what do we need, how do we need to change ourselves to make sure that this place is, is, is protected yeah. and that might be a better that that's worked better so far for Antarctica and it might work better yeah. for the rest of the world too so yeah I think that's a um a very good place to stop and plan our next webinar which will be how to um take the successes of the Antarctic um and move it uh, move them into other parts of uh the world um it's been a great pleasure for me and privilege to be involved in this. And it's a bit sad that we've come to an end so quickly because there are so many questions flying up on the chat there for me. Um, it's, I think I'd like to thank all the panelists and Claire um, for uh, their very fascinating and um, passionate um, uh, talks and their commitment to broad-based, across-alliance uh, conservation of the Antarctic and the peninsula area in particular. Um, to, as Claire noted, we are clearly at a crossroads and we need all of the stakeholders uh, to work together to um, ensure that we actually have 
um, a future for the Antarctic um, as we envisage here. So thank you all very much. Um, maybe I just give everybody three or four um, words. If you want to leave a final um, word to everybody. Um, Caesar, I keep putting you on the spot. So, you know, one point you'd like um, our uh, audience to think about going forward. Um, oh, so the, the last bit was, was a tough one. <laughs> I know, I just want to say thanks for the invitation and it's really good to have these opportunities to one of the good things of this um, crazy times uh, we're living now is that we have uh, learned how to uh, communicate the stuff we're doing and to incorporate people all over the world and and this is a really important issue that we uh, should discuss more and more so yeah thank you thank you very much caesar paul yeah thank you it's been a, a great pleasure to be here so uh, i i'd say that what we need to do is to to continue working through the uh, system that we all, uh, already have established um, i think we need to get the strong ownership established for the fundamental concepts that we want to see go, go forward and then we need which is probably the hardest is to find that political will around the world to to, to turn the corner so that's that's yeah. probably what i what i think is needed yeah so true thank you so much paul um amanda yeah thank you all it's been a real honor to be on this panel with everyone and um great to have this discussion thanks very much and just echoing the others really i think there's always that theme of